Welcome everyone to uh, this session of uh, Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Lionel Briand. Uh, Lionel holds a CRC1 chair at the University of Ottawa in uh, Canada and also is uh, affiliated with ST uh, at University of Luxembourg. He has done lots of uh, amazing work. I don't think he needs an introduction, uh, particularly from someone uh, like me, uh, but uh, he has a long-standing interest in evolutionary, applying evolutionary algorithms, search-based techniques, machine learning, AI in uh, various aspects of software engineering and particularly testing. And he will be talking exactly about that uh, topic today. So without further ado, I give the floor to Lionel. The, this meeting is being recorded. It will be posted on YouTube. If you don't want to appear on the recording, you can always log in as guest and turn off your camera, it should be fine. Thanks again, Lionel, for having ac accepted our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, so, well, you know what I'm going to talk about, basically, uh, uh, testing cyber physical systems, or rather test automation in cyber physical systems. So uh, I will be focusing on how we can leverage AI and I will be focusing also on industrial research. I mean, uh, real problems, real solutions in real context. Uh, it's, I'm going to relate my personal experience, and it's not a survey. I'm not trying to do a survey here. Uh, I will use example projects to do that and try to draw lessons learned. And of course, this is only a very partial presentation, which probably already has too many slides, but uh, I will uh, handle that. <clears throat> Uh, the work I'm uh, reporting, uh, or the projects I'm, I'm reporting about, uh, are projects that were performed in collaboration with many students and colleagues who are listed on those slides, and I would like to acknowledge that. So let me start with an introduction for those who are not uh, very familiar with cyber physical systems and, and all that. Uh, so we know what the main general challenge of testing is, is scalability. For complex systems, uh, testing could be infinite. You know, you know. So the question is, uh, how do we handle that? Uh, and automation, of course, is a prerequisite for scalability. Full automation is a prerequisite for scalability. It's not sufficient, but that's a prerequisite. The practicality is also an important impact, an important factor that I will uh, I will discuss in my examples. Is, and what I mean by that is that. You should only expect realistic inputs from the user or from the engineer, and you should provide outputs that can be clearly useful for well-identified use cases. Otherwise, uh, practicality can be questioned. So you know what cyber-physical systems are, but if you are not uh, very familiar with that, here is a definition. A system of collaborating computational elements controlling physical entities. Uh, those uh, CPS are increasingly autonomous, for example, in the automotive domain. They increasingly rely on machine learning. For example, they use uh, deep neural networks in the perception layer. Uh, they, are, they actually act on the physical environment. Usually, they don't just provide recommendations. And what that means is that there are safety implications, usually. Uh, CPS are not developed like you develop web applications. There are very specific technologies and constraints and phases of development. So typically, but of course this is an oversimplification, uh, but we need to simplify to be able to discuss it. Uh, there was a model in the loop stage where basically everything is, uh, is a functional model. Uh, the controllers are uh, the physical environment, and typically uh, the functional languages that are used for that uh, and that can be simulated uh, are uh, widely commercially available. I mean, you don't need to use uh, to rely on some uh, academic uh, uh, solution. For, and the most well-known one is probably MATLAB Simulink uh, that you probably have heard about because this is used in every, nearly every uh, uh, cyber physical system. And so usually at that stage, you, you simulate models and you test models from a, te from a testing standpoint. And so you have the software in the loop stage where 
uh, actual code is generated from the Simic models, and additional code is being developed. Uh, and the environment is still simulated. Sometimes people use uh, modeling languages like SysML to model the structure, behavior, and traceability of the system, but it's not systematic. It depends on the domains and the standards that people have to follow. And then you have the hardware in the loop stage where the actual system is deployed on the actual deployment platform and interacts either with hardware or analog simulators. And of course, at that stage, testing is very expensive. While at the modern loop stage, uh, testing is only limited by your computational resources. So testing cyber physical system at the mill and seal uh, stage, uh, it's mostly a problem of uh, computation because you run simulation usually of physical models. At the hill stage, it's more of human effort because you need to set up the hardware and the analog simulators. Uh, the number of test execution anyway tends to be limited uh, compared to other type of systems because uh, each test execution, each test case execution is really expensive, but of course it varies from system to system. But if you have a simulator in the loop or hardware in the loop, then it's, uh, it's expensive. Uh, the test input space, of course, of those systems is extremely large because it's basically determined by the complexity of the physical environment in which they evolve, which usually is not simple. Uh, traceability uh, is usually a requirement for those uh, systems, whatever the domain, uh, between the system testing and requirements. It's mandated by standards. And safety analysis, of course, is important and requires to understand uh, failure conditions and assess risks. Also, those systems are more and more uh, often based on machine learning. So usually you have a, a system with input and output, and it has machine learning components inside. They do not represent a majority of the code. Of course, they represent really a small percentage of the code, but increasingly they play critical roles. Uh, so for example, uh, for an EDA system, uh, an average driving assistance system, uh, usually within the EDAS, you have decision modules and control modules uh, that are implementing using, for example, deep neural networks or other the machine learning algorithms. Uh, so sensor data and, and camera data from the environment are used, uh, for example, to recognize pedestrians. Uh, that's uh, one example. And usually this is based on machine learning and in particular nowadays, uh, deep learning. So uh, I don't need probably to convince you that uh, machine learning algorithms are more and more present in cyber physical systems who are increasingly autonomous. Uh, and that therefore, uh, from a testing standpoint, we need to do something about that. Uh, here are example in the automotive domain, the concrete example where machine learning is used, object detection, sensor fusion for scene comprehension. Uh, driver monitoring or even driver replacement, uh, managing the powertrain, for example, uh, motor control or battery management. Increasingly, those things are done with uh, you know, machine learning. Uh, when I, uh, I said I was going to talk about uh, how to leverage artificial intelligence for test automation of cyber physical systems, I was uh, thinking of four types of techniques. That's what I call artificial intelligence. It's not just machine learning, but also meta heuristic search, natural language processing, and solvers, such as SMT solvers, which are basically exhaustive search technologies. <clears throat> and together, as we'll see an example, they often lead to complete scalable practical solutions. As we will see, usually there isn't a single technical solution to a problem that doesn't exist. It's more a matter of uh, cleverly combining them to solve a problem in a given context. So here is the first example of an industry project. It's, it's a bit old now. It's four or five years old, that research, but I thought I would go through it. Uh, so as I said, uh, we are with, well, when we are in the model in the loop stage, controllers are simulate models very often, and they need to be tested. I mean, simulate models are software. That software is more and more complicated. The software that runs on a control unit is more and more complicated for a number of reasons. Uh, Simulink, for those who don't know, is a data flow uh, uh, language based on block diagrams. Uh, it's very, very widely used by engineers all over the world who develop cyber physical systems. 
uh, it's executable and it enable code generation. And it must be tested, obviously. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, specific challenges uh, for Simulink. Usually, uh, they are mixed of discrete and continuous behaviors because they also model physical behavior. Uh, so what that means is that many inputs and outputs are signals that is functions over time. They are not just values. Uh, and uh, they need usually, they are configurable usually because they need to be configured for, for example, for different engines. And uh, usually there isn't a correct answer, what or correct output, sorry. Uh, what you want is a good enough output given the context. So developing test oracles is a bit uh, complicated in general. So for example, if we test a closed loop controller with a feedback loop, so you have a controller uh, that sends comments to a plant model because the environment, the hardware and the environment is also a simulated model here in, in, in our context. Uh, you then uh, get the actual value of what you control, and based on that, the controllers they compute the next command. And uh, so, for example, it can be opening a valve or uh, adjusting a throttle, uh, whatever that is. So here we are talking about uh, testing at a low level, testing of controllers, which is an important part, of course, of cyber physical system. So if we simplify and we assume, for example, that a test input is simply an initial desired value and a final desired value, you provide a test input, you get a signal, uh, uh, sorry, as output, that signal is not exactly what you wanted, but the question is whether it's good enough. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we talk to, we work with engineers and we came up with a technique based on search, meta heuristic search, among other things. But first we had to understand what were the requirements of such signals, what are the requirements that engineers care about, and they came up with three of them, or three main ones, stability, smoothness, and responsiveness. And based on these requirements, we define objective functions for the search. And uh, I'll go through the steps uh, in a minute or two. But first, uh, what is responsiveness? Is how fast you get to the position where you're supposed to get. Whether you get there in a smooth way, that is, there are no bumps that could damage the hardware, and whether you reach a stable signal. And so we uh, we devised a number of steps. The first step is more based on exploratory search, where you try to uh, explore the the space defined by uh, the FD and ID. And uh, based uh, on that, you devise a, a heat map and you identify high risk areas, which are then selected by the engineers for further explorations. And then based on a more dedicated or exploitative type of search, you identify worst case scenarios, uh, such as uh, large undershoots or slow response times, uh, for example. Uh, of course, it's not that simple because those models are configurable. They have to be configured, for example, for different engines. So uh, it's a challenge because that means that the input space is even much larger because it also includes uh, the configuration parameters. <clears throat> but however, not all configuration parameters matter for all objective functions. But it makes it harder to visualize the results. We cannot use a heat map, of course, because we have many dimensions. Search becomes slower. So we had to come up with some solution to address that. And again, we use different, different techniques coming from AI, some form of dimensionality reduction where we get rid of the configuration parameters that do not seem to impact certain objective functions. We use regression trees to help engineers visualize the high risk areas. And we use some form of surrogate modeling based on machine learning to, you will see, to avoid simulations, which is uh, uh, an important uh, uh, part of the test cost. So why regression trees? Because regression trees, you can actually uh, show partition of a multi-dimensional space and help people visualize what are the partitions that are high risk. For example, in our case, uh, the partition that have very poor smoothness, for example, in terms of requirements. And uh, so it's just a partition mechanism and a visualization mechanism that can replace heat maps. And surrogate modeling, what is it? It's really based on some form of machine learning and it's trying to identify in critical partitions 
where you have a higher risk of a, of a requirement violation, is trying to identify what are the cases where you can predict accurately what will be the fitness. And in that case, you don't run the simulator. On the other hand, if you uh, if you are not, you don't expect high accuracy in predicting fitness, uh, you, uh, you then you run the simulation. But then we can still save a lot of simulation time. So that's the idea is that uh, whenever you can predict uh, very accurately what will be the fitness, you skip the simulation stage. And in fact, uh, we uh, we have of course uh, evaluated uh, our approach, and we realized that actually uh, accounting for the configuration was extremely important in order to find worst case scenarios. And we found actually worst case scenarios that were pretty bad that engineers were not aware of. Another example, this time we are at a higher level before we're talking about testing at a low level, testing controllers. Here we are uh, talking about testing uh, advanced driving assistance system. It's a bit larger, uh, a higher level type of testing. Um, so you know what they are. Huh? You probably have some on your car. Yeah, you know, they are automated emergency braking, for example. Uh, you have seen that diagram before, but they are, and ADAS gets data from sensors on the car and from sensors and camera uh, to get information about the environment, for example, about, about pedestrians or other obstacles on the road, uh, and then uh, basically implements these decision mechanisms and control, uh, control uh, comments. Uh, the, and the commons are then sent to actuators such as the brake or the throttle or other actuators. Uh, so I'm using uh, automotive examples, but of course this can be generalized to many cyber physical systems in other domains. Uh, so the automotive environment, like many of those environments, is complicated. You can imagine different road topologies, weather conditions, building and pedestrians. Uh, the trajectories of other cars, of pedestrians, some of them on the road, uh, you know, so that's complicated and those systems, they must comply with functional safety standards, like, you know, such as 26262 and now also you have newer standards, uh, such as a standard that used to be called SOTIF, which is a pass, ISO pass standard. Uh, so it's a challenge for testing. So that's what we did with that company, IE. Uh, we are still working with them, actually. Uh, and we try to help engineer efficiently and effectively explore the scenario space for an ADA system and to identify critical failure relating test scenarios. But more importantly, beside that, we need to then use that information to identify input conditions that lead or that are highly likely to lead to critical scenarios, such as safety violations. So it's not just a matter of getting failures, it's about making sense out of the failures as well. Uh, so here is an example of a system I use as an example. So there is a, a, a sensor on the car that tells you whether there is an object uh, in the field of view of the car and the position and speed of the object. And then if that is the case, that information is passed to a camera that has a more sophisticated software running on it. And that determines whether it's a pedestrian. And based on that, uh, break commons are performed or not. Uh, so here is an example of a, a requirement. Uh, so if the system properly detects a pedestrian in front of the car with a high degree of certainty, so this is done by the software on the camera, not by the ADAS system. So if we're in that situation, then uh, you should not have, the car should not hit a pedestrian with a high speed, whatever high speed means. If that is the case, then this is a failure for the, obviously for the EAB system. Uh, <clears throat> so you can try to test that on the road, of course, but we know what the problem is. The problems are, of course, Google does that. Many people do that, but uh, I don't think that uh, the first testing phase should be on the road, ideally. At least if you are in a country that cares about safety, you know. Uh, and uh, so a lot of people, of course, do simulation-based testing with simulators uh, that are, uh, you know, based on physical mathematical models, often in Simulink again, but not necessarily. 
So if you test via a physics-based simulator, you are testing an ADAS here. Your test input is actually a, a configuration of the simulator, uh, where you configure what are the other vehicle, the pedestrian, their speed, their trajectory, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the test output is a timestamp set of values for critical uh, part for, for critical variables, such as whether or not uh, a collision happened at what speed, uh, or you know what how close you were to a collision. There are ways to measure that, for example, and that in a timestamped way. Uh, but of course, the problem is that the test input space is very large. Explaining failures is not easy. You can imagine. Uh, and uh, well, and, and it's very expensive from a computational standpoint. So we have an approach where we use a mix of simple machine learning and search, multi-objective multi search and entry classification algorithms. Why multi-objective? Because we have three objective functions. We try to minimize the distance between a pedestrian and the field of view of the car, and we try to maximize uh, car speed at the time of collision, if there is a collision. And also, we want to maximize the probability that the object is recognized as a pedestrian by the camera. And uh, okay, of course, uh, during the search, each time you generate a new scenario, uh, in theory, you have to run uh, the simulation. So you know, probably, I don't need to explain that. You know what Python optimization is with an algorithm like an SGA two. Uh, so. It's, I don't need to go through that, probably given the audience. Uh, the good thing for us is that uh, it also maintains a solution diversity in the Pareto optimal front, which is always useful for testing purposes. Uh, and the way we combine it with machine learning, uh, you will see it in a minute, but let me uh, just show you how the search would work intuitively using animation. So let's assume we have a simple two dimensional space. So we generate initial inputs, we compute fitness in terms of what I've talked about before. Uh, we select according to fitness, we breed, and we repeat. How do we uh, introduce better guidance by using decision trees or classification trees? Because we need better guidance to uh, improve uh, performance. Uh, we use classification trees, why first? Because as you know, as I said before, classification trees are a technique to partition a space, in our case, the search space or the input space uh, in such a way that we have partitions with a very low risk, for example, of collision and partitions with a very high risk of collision. Uh, and how do we use that in the search? Again, intuitively, uh, we do the same thing, fitness computation, but here we identify high risk area, we partition the space, then we select only in high risk areas, we breed and we keep iterating. And so we somehow obtain the process which is on this slide. And actually, results show that it's much more efficient at finding worst case scenarios, at finding worse uh, Pareto fronts, according to par the usual Pareto front metrics. And also, we see that uh, the decision trees that we generate, generation after generation, become more and more precise at capturing high risk areas, which is extremely useful for us. Because remember that we also want to learn, uh, we also want to learn uh, what are the conditions that characterize high risk areas. The, the engineer's feedback was interesting. They said, okay, yes, it's useful for debugging, but also it's useful for us to understand, uh, you know, whether hardware changes are necessary, for example. Uh, if you realize that you could avoid high risk inputs uh, by having a camera with a wider field of view, then you can argue that to your management. You can say, well, listen, we have problems in those cases. If we have a, a better camera, we can avoid those problems. And you can also provide warnings to, to the drivers. But in fact, what I presented is a simplification of reality because in practice, uh, you have a lot of autonomous features, a lot of, of those ADAS systems that actually interact with the same actuators and the same sensors. And so there is a potential for conflicts or for undesired feature interactions. So we have worked on that as well, and we have a paper on that, but I won't cover it. But in practice, the situation is more complicated because of undesired feature interactions. So another example, which is interesting because this time it involves a solver, uh, is that very often, uh, and this is research we did with companies in the aerospace domain, 
so usually uh, people develop simulate models. Uh, and of course, they need to check, as I said, whether they fulfill requirements. But usually they fulfill requirements under certain assumptions, for example, about the environment. And those assumptions are really, really explicit for whatever strange reason. You know. So, but you cannot test those models without knowing the assumptions. Otherwise, you generate a lot of garbage scenarios and garbage inputs. And then, uh, you know, you have to analyze a lot of the funny outputs. So, uh, for example, if you have an, auto, an autopilot, uh, and the autopilot is about uh, bringing a plane to a certain altitude within 500 seconds, that's a requirement. It may, of course, this is not achievable under any condition. It depends on how much power through the throttle the pilot is providing to the plane. So that's a simple assumption. You need to have power, enough power in the engines to reach the desired altitude. So that's uh, an assumption that is made to satisfy, uh, for the autopilot to satisfy uh, that requirement. Oops. How come I don't? Yeah. So our goal is to infer automatically requirements assumptions. Uh, such as the one I've mentioned before, uh, so that you now you need enough boost to the engine uh, for the autopilot to satisfy the requirements. Uh, but I won't go through the details. And we came up with a technique that mixes a smart sampling strategies. We use the Estalero tool for falsification, uh, assumption generation based on the data generated. And here we use a simple technique, decision trees, and a more complicated one, genetic programming. Genetic programming is much more complicated, but it allows us to come up with more complex assumptions that are not possible with a decision tree. And then the next step is to say, okay, once we have identified potential assumption is to actually check with the model checking whether those assumptions are actually verified. They are true. Yeah. That, uh, if they are true, the requirement is always satisfied. All right. Another example here, here where I picked that example because we use a natural language processing. Let me check the time. Sorry. Okay. Uh, that, as I told you, uh, in practice, uh, requirements are still very much into natural language sometimes structured, sometimes satisfying uh, templates, but, uh, and it's not fading away anytime soon. It doesn't change for 20 years. Uh, it doesn't change at all in 20 years. It won't change in the next uh, 20 years. So the problem when we do requirements driven testing is that we are dealing with a natural language requirements. I'll talk about that. Uh, and very often those requirements, they serve as contract and they have many stakeholders, and they are the basis for independent acceptance testing, which confirm whether or not you have satisfied the contract. And uh, the reason, I guess, very often they are still in natural language is because usually they are shared ac across many stakeholders and many organizations. <clears throat> so, as I've mentioned briefly before, in practice, standards, customers require traceability between uh, requirements and test cases, system test cases. Requirements change and therefore test cases as well. So people uh, usually in practice, they manage used traceability matrices, which makes no sense and usually they're incorrect, but that's the practice often you see. There is a lot of academic work on automatically matching requirements and test cases, uh, but the results are not good enough for practice, though there is a recent paper at XC, uh, the last XC, where they seem to get much better results than before by using language models, by using BERT, something like that. Uh, so anyway, here, uh, it's, we did a project again in the automotive domain, and this, this was applied to those uh, safety critical embedded system like uh, occupy, uh, um, uh, like uh, seat occupancy recognition and uh, controlling the airbags and stuff like that. It may seem simple, but it's not simple because, uh, you know, roads have bumps. <laughs> Things happen and you don't want, uh, you don't want the system to do something stupid. Uh, <clears throat> you know. Um, 
All right. So, uh, uh, ideally, so the problem is to automatically check compliance between a system, often with hardware in the loop, uh, and uh, their uh, functional requirements. So here we're talking about testing with hardware in the loop. If you remember the diagram I had at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so what we decided to do, the strategy we decided to adopt, instead of searching for traces, is to support the generation of system test cases from requirements in natural language. And here in that case, then traceability is a byproduct. So of course, you know what the problems are, that textual descriptions are ambiguous and complete, often not analyzable. You know, people often cannot even write uh, uh, grammatically correct requirements. So, you know, it makes things a bit difficult. Uh, and so what we decided is to find a compromise. I mean, like often in software engineering, you have, you have to find in a given context compromises, uh, which depend on the context. Uh, so we decided to stick to natural language, but to restrict it so that it's amenable to effective natural language processing for system testing purposes. And the goal is really full automation here. It's not just to help the human in the loop, because this prevents scalability. If you have thousands and thousands of test cases, like it is usually the case, if you have a human in the loop at any point, uh, unless it's for a very, very limited number of cases, uh, you are in trouble. Uh, so we try to find the right balance. So we use something that uh, an old, uh, not an old, but a former PhD student of mine developed called restricted use case specifications, which is a more disciplined way of writing use cases, if you will, specifications. Uh, and the reason why we did this is because uh, this company, this automotive company, like many others, were already writing use case specifications. So what we had is to make them do it better. That was easier um, than rather come up with something completely different. And what is this? It's a form of this specification where you have keywords and you have restrictions in terms of the sentences you can write. And it's supported by an, L an NLP based tool that tells you when you violate a rule and makes suggestions. And so basically helps people write proper use case specifications using natural language processing in real time. Uh, and why is that important? Because those keywords, they allow us to identify steps in the flow of use cases, to identify the nature of the steps, whether it's an input step, an output step, a conditional step. You know. Otherwise, it's not that easy if people write random sentences. But it's still also legible by people who are not technical, with very, very little training. Uh, and of course, you have alternative flows and, you know, like what you have in any use case specifications. Okay. And then based on that, we can identify domain entities. We can identify things that are likely to be inputs and outputs in the use cases. We can identify constraints which would be necessary to generate test case data. Uh, and basically based on all those use case specifications, we can derive a test model where you, know, you have a form of control flow with different nodes representing the different types of steps. Uh, in the use cases, and therefore uh, every path in those test models are test scenarios, and they are associated with conditions and inputs and outputs. So you see slowly we're getting towards testing. Uh, so uh, we developed a tool that takes use case specification in that form, but also a domain model. We need a domain model, which is a simple class diagram, so nothing really complicated for at least for engineers in the automated domain, and the constraints uh, coming from the test model. So here we assumed uh, a constraint language, which is the OCL, because uh, you know it's the standard constraint language in the context of model-based development. Uh, but of course, then the question you have in mind is, well, okay, where does that OCL come from? What we had before were natural language, uh, natural language uh, constraints. I'll tell you in a minute. You know. So, but anyway, uh, for each path, you have a number of, of, of constraints that you have to transform in OCL constraints. Uh, so you have to go to something that looks like this, the system validated that no error has been detected with something in OCL like that, that is based on our domain model, which is a class diagram. Uh, so that means for each uh, 
path, for each scenario, each path we have a pass condition. And of course, the problem uh, at the system level is that those conditions they tend to be complicated. You know, to rely on uh, quantifiers and complicated operations, and you know, so you you'll see in a minute how we dealt with that. And the way we dealt with that is that we built a dedicated constraint solving or pledge tool, which is available, which can handle those very very complicated sentences by smartly combining. SMT solving and meta heuristic search. And by combining those two things together, we are able to develop a solver that can actually deal with the type of complicated constraints you have at the system level in software systems, uh, which you cannot use with any, you, for which you cannot use any standard solver. So, anyway, and the way we got our constraints because engineers don't like to write or see constraints. I mean a little bit, but not too much. Uh, that we again, you used uh, uh, NLP to go from a constraint in natural language to an OCL constraint. And the way it works is that it's based on a technique called SRL uh, for role modeling, uh, uh, an NLP technique that somehow identified the role of words in a sentence according to some taxonomy. Based on that, we match those words with concepts in the domain model. And then we have verb specific transformation rules to go from the text to OCL based on that. That OCL, of course, constraint being based on our domain model, our class diagram. There are many details, but I'm just giving you an overview. And it's actually, it works very well. It works very well. All right. Now, the last thing I want to discuss before I, I go to the conclusions is that I told you before that many of those systems contain uh, in, increasingly machine learning components, such as deep learning components. So what do you do with this? So let's take an example. For example, uh, with in the automotive domain, very often people have increasingly in luxury cars have internal cameras that observe the driver, for example. Uh, and what they do is that they detect, as you maybe can see on the image, they detect key points. For example, uh, the corner of the eyes, or the tip of the nose, uh, stuff like that. And this is used, for example, for drowsiness detection. When you know if the driver falls asleep, there is some kind of alarm or, or other things can happen. Uh, and uh, of course, this is done increasingly by deep neural networks, what I call KPDNNs because it's a natural application for neural networks. Uh, so, and of course, they have to be tested because if they, if they don't work, you can, ima you can imagine the possible safety consequences. All right, so how, what do we do? Uh, basically, each key point in the image become a requirement and a test objective. For example, in, a, in the case study for which I got those images before, we have 27 key points on the image. And this is again with the same company. And uh, the goal of, of testing is to cause the DNN to mispredict as many key points as possible. And for that, we use many objective search, not multi objective search, but many objective search, because the, the test objectives are independent, combined with a simulator. So at a high level, you have an input generator, which is based on uh, many objective search, uh, that feeds a simulator, that generate test images that are used by input by the DNN, that predict key points, that allows us to compute fitness by comparing actual and predicted key points, and then provide a fitness score to the input generator. So we have a, a system, a search-based system, to actually test uh, those uh, key point DNNs. That fits very well. And it works pretty well in terms of finding critical inputs. So, for example, here you have a misprediction because you know the green point is here, the red point is there. It's because the mouth is more or less hidden by a shadow because of the position of the head. So it cannot predict that key point well. I'll come back to that. Uh, so our approach is very effective. We find actually a lot of problems with most of the key points. But not all mispredictions are failures. This is very interesting. This is why I'm saying oracles are not obvious for that type of systems. Why? Because 
if a key point is hidden by a shadow, well, you cannot expect the DNN to predict it. Huh? It's not a failure. It's a, it's a natural limitation of the DNN. You know. uh, and moreover, um, to, uh, for most applications, like drowsiness detection, you don't need predictions of the 27 key points to make a good decision. You just need a subset. So the system has to choose the right subset depending on the position of the head. So, and some uh, key points nevertheless were more severely predicted by other, and usually it's because either they were underrepresented, uh, you know, uh, or uh, they were quite complex and they needed more training data. But uh, that's exactly what you want a testing technique to help you with. And also you want to interpret, of course. So again, here we use regression trees to interpret based on the, the inputs of the simulator or the configuration parameters. Uh, what are the conditions that lead to a high probability of misprediction? And we found again that this was due, for example, to shadows, as I mentioned before, uh, and therefore the position of the head. Uh, but in general, uh, our rule that predicted whether or not the DNN worked based on testing results uh, were very accurate, extremely accurate. And so this was uh, extremely useful to engineers because they can use those rules to decide whether or not to believe a prediction. All right, uh, last uh, in the same context of DNA enabled system or ML enabled systems, uh, the problem is that when you use deep neural networks, uh, you, many of the techniques that I use for safety analysis are not usable anymore. You cannot really program analysis, you cannot do code inspections, and it's, you know, it's very, it's not doable with a deep neural network. Um, so uh, the question is what, how can we help people with that? Uh, so what we need is we need to understand the conditions of critical failures in large setting, the first thing. So if you use a simulator, those critical conditions have to be defined in terms of configuration parameters. If you use real images, if we're talking about images here, let's assume all the inputs are images. Uh, uh, it's in terms of the presence of concepts in the images. And based on that, you need to perform some form of risk assessment. And we need to do research to help people with that, to perform that type of safety engineering uh, in the context of ML, enable syst autonomous systems, usually cyber physical systems. So you know how usually a DNN is validated. You, you have a test set, you have a training set, you have a test set, and you identify error reducing images in our case, and based on that, you compute the accuracy of the DNN. But that's not enough for safety purposes uh, because many uh, actually inaccurate predictions may not have serious consequences on the system. Uh, so, uh, or uh, are unavoidable. So what we need to do is to help people identify unsafe situations, do some form of root cause analysis. Uh, so you have a lot of images where you have bad predictions, a lot of them where you have good predictions and it can be, we are talking thousands of images and you need to somehow figure out what is going on. So if you do it manually, it's very error prone and it's, uh, you know, <laughs> not a very good way to go, I would say. And uh, so you need to automatically identify the characteristics that lead to bad predictions. So, of course, you have techniques that exist already from the machine learning literature, about, for example, generating heat maps that tell you to which extent pixels in an image impact a specific result or prediction. Uh, but it's not really a solution for us because it maps still have to be manually inspected. So, and you have to somehow understand the reason from this classification from thousands of heat maps. Uh, uh, dangerous failures that are rare, you probably would not notice them in a, a large pool of images. And also the debugging of the DNA based on the testing is not automated. So we work on a technique called uh, HUD it map based and supervised debugging of DNNs that combines uh, cluster, uh, clustering, in, a, in particular kind of clustering, with heat maps. And what it does, it's used this, we used it for uh, different uh, applications such as 
uh, gaze detections, open eyes uh, detection, head pulse detection, stuff like that. Uh, and it's a complicated process. I'm not going to go through it, but basically it's clustering images that lead to problems in such a way that those images have common root cases. And then it's using those clusters to generate additional images for training, for additional training. So intuitively, that's what is happening uh, in that process. Uh, and this, the clustering is, is based on activation values of internal layers of the deep neural network. So we cluster images based on the heat maps of internal layers so that they are somehow similar in terms of uh, the pixel that played a role in the prediction of the classification, meaning that very likely uh, the root causes for the misclassification or misprediction of those images is similar. And we get uh, yes clusters that look like this. So for example, uh, uh, where uh, for the gaze detection application, uh, where we automatically determine where the driver is looking. Uh, we have uh, different cases where we have misprediction, borderline cases, which is uh, to be expected. So those borderline cases, they need more training data to be more accurate. Uh, uh, incomplete set of cases, we realize that there was a direction that was not part of the classes we were trying to predict, like when the driver was looking middle center, it was missing. So there was a class we are not predicting. So of course it was predicting uh, something else. Uh, we were not labeling this in our training data. And of course in complaining training set, for example, we, uh, the DNA didn't know what to do when the eyes were almost closed. So that helped a lot engineers to understand what were the limitation of the DNA and what could be the consequences, what could be done to improve the situation. I think I skipped that one. <laughs> Yes, sorry, I wanted to talk about mutation analysis for CPS. As you can imagine, it's not a piece of cake, but I'll, uh, I'll skip that. So let me go through the conclusions quickly. So of course, I gave you only a subset of project examples. There are many, many other projects. I, will, I picked examples that would allow me to support my conclusions, uh, but we have a lot of similar projects. What is the role of meta metaheuristic search? Most test automation problems can be re-expressed into search problems or stochastic optimization problems. Uh, there are issues, of course. Uh, the issues is uh, usually scalability. You know, you have to find a technique that scales. That's where machine learning can help. It can help provide, as we have seen, an example, perhaps better guidance uh, or avoid simulation, as we have seen. Uh, so it can help actually improve scalability. And also it's very useful to interpret test results to understand, as I've mentioned before, what are the conditions uh, that lead to uh, mispredictions, for example, and then help people assess the risks. Natural language processing, as we have seen, it help exploit information, which is in natural language. And uh, in software development, there is a lot of information in natural language. So we need to somehow use that. We have seen an example with requirements-driven testing. Search-based solutions are, as I said briefly, have a lot of advantages. I won't, you know, they are versatile. They help relax assumptions compared to exact approaches. They are scalable in the sense that they are easy to parallelize, but choose, choosing the right uh, search algorithm can be very tricky for a given problem. Uh, it requires massive empirical studies for validation, and runtime performance can be an issue. So search is rarely sufficient by itself as a solution. That's why, and we have seen many examples in, in, the, in the projects I've shown before, a single technology approaches rarely work in practice. What I've seen work in practice is usually a clever mix of uh, search, machine learning, NLP, solvers, statistical approaches, and of course, system and environment modeling and simulation. Somehow, for a given problem in a given context, uh, find uh, an optimal combination, a smart combination of those, of some of those technologies or a subset of those technologies. And you cannot say that a particular combination or particular strategy works well for all. It doesn't. It depends a lot on the cost of test execution, 
uh, and many uh, how much to which extent you control the simulator if you use a simulator uh, and many other things and all right so okay. anyway i think i'll uh, i'll uh, stop here on that slide uh, so real solutions uh, required to strike a balance in terms of scalability, practicality, applicability, and offering a maximum level of dependability guarantees. And uh, therefore, it requires multidisciplinary research. And uh, with a good understanding of the context and the working assumptions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lionel. Uh, we still have time for a few questions while Lionel is showing uh, some references, I guess. Yes, yes our references. Uh, if you, I'll share the slides. Thank you for for meal, heal, and seal. <laughs> Good. So we have time for questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Otherwise, I could start. Okay. So you know, yeah. maybe a technical question. You had a slide where you had Pareto analysis and and uh, a Pareto front, and then you said that helps you diversify the test cases. Could you explain? how your Pareto analysis helps you uh, generate uh, diverse test cases? Because uh, there is a, a mechanism in the NSG2 algorithm we have used uh, to ensure population diversity on the Pareto front. I see, I see. It's part of the algorithm, but in general, if you use something else, uh, a, a more dedicated algorithm, uh, which sometimes you need, you, you know, you cannot always do Pareto front optimization. It doesn't always make sense. Uh, then you need to make sure that there is an effective mechanism to ensure diversity. Yes. Uh, so that your search doesn't focus on certain areas. Yeah. Uh. Yep. Uh, in, in two different parts of your, uh, unless there are other questions from the audience, I don't want to take all the time for questions. But uh, in two different parts, you mentioned the, the problem of uh, looking at different configurations. Uh, did you look at all at these sampling techniques like two Ys, N Ys that, that were used? In yes, yes, of course. Uh, that makes sense. But uh, in our case, we are looking for worst case scenarios, mm -hmm. which is often what you need. What you're talking about is more to ensure a certain degree of coverage. It's not the same objective, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, the objective is different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, is, is, are there any questions? Or shall I ask a third one? Uh, regarding... No. Maybe. Go ahead. Yes, Bashar, please, go ahead. Well, well, so, so I guess I'll ask a non-technical question, Lionel. You know, thank, thanks for the talk. I mean, it's an impressive body of work. I guess my 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 question is maybe just to ask for your opinion about the role of humans in or, or end users in, in these applications. They, they seem very engineering critical applications in which there is a role for a user, of course, but the user doesn't seem to be a significant player in the loop in terms of formulation of requirements. They somehow requirements are are produced are, are somehow already specced at some level. I'm just wondering to what extent as we move increasingly to, to systems where they're cyber physical, social, or they're more much more human intensive, that some, some requirements that are harder to specify become harder to test, and the testing process itself may be a process that is also partly an elicitation process as well as a testing one. Yes. yes. I'm wondering if you have any reflections on the role of, of humans in this in this in this whole setup. Yes, first, uh, the requirements of those systems become increasingly more complicated and requirements have to be defined by humans. Huh? There is no way around that. Uh, and if you have poor requirements, you have poor testing. So uh, then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the testing and, uh, testing and test automation requirements engineering are very closely tied. Yeah. Uh, because one enables the other, you know. So, and uh, and also testing often allows you to refine your requirements because you realize that uh, you find stuff that should not be allowed, but it's allowed. <laughs> so, uh, uh, all right. Um, so that's uh, one, uh, one thing. So those systems, yes, have increasingly very complex requirements and actually those requirements become increasingly difficult to express. Uh, 
So uh, not necessarily at a high level, but at a lower level when you are talking about signals in input and outputs of, uh, you know, for example, controllers. Um, you know, for example, we had a project with a satellite company and the behavior of the satellite was very, very complex to specify in terms of requirements. You know, it had to add certain angles, reach that angle in a certain time, and it depended also on the environment, uh, uh, the electromagnetic field, and God knows what, you know. And the properties became very complicated, so complicated that we had to devise a domain-specific language for people to express it. So we had to do some form of qualitative analysis of all the concepts that people needed to handle when specifying requirements. <laughs> you know, so all this is very human intensive. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, but the domain specificity uh, might be different from human focus. So, so there are things about the domain that one needs to to delve, and of course, you have to talk to humans and understand the domain better. But I guess there are perhaps emergent human behaviors as a result of introducing your system, perhaps that might require at mm -hmm. least taking into account. And, and, and you know, you mentioned that sometimes the testing can help can help to inform requirements or refine requirements. I couldn't see in the big diagram that you had it, the, in, the, in the beginning that laid out your, your research space, even the icon for a human. <laughs> so, so sometimes researchers, you know, put a little stick person there to just somehow reflect the fact that there's a human. No, but that diagram was a simplification. It was just to show that it was a simplification, of course. I mean, I, there was no feedback loop in that diagram. Uh, you know, uh, it was just to show that there were three uh, high-level phases uh, that are very common when developing CPS. Um, so uh, do not overinterpret the diagram as showing all the flow of information of everything. Uh, that's not uh, the case. But uh, I don't know. There are many things that need to be that the humans need to get into. I mean. If you know there are situations where the system is not going to work well, which is testing is supposed to tell you, yeah. uh, then you have to assess the risk. Is that acceptable or not acceptable? Is that ethical or not ethical? I guess your testing community has looked at fairness, for example, which is a very yes. human. And, and for example, yes. testing for fairness has been at least touched by the testing community. Yes. Where, exactly. where where does the discussion of where those kinds uh, of properties might come? Sorry, Bashar, you know, we, we are running out of time. Do you, Lionel, do you still have a few more minutes to spend with us? We no. have a couple more people asking, wanting to no, ask. I, I have no problem with uh, staying as long as you want. So it's fine. It's always nice to have a chat with my dear colleagues. Uh, so may maybe you could uh, answer Bashar's question, and then we can move on to the next person. I uh, would have to remember. He was talking so it about was about fairness. Testing fairness as one of the human aspects to be tested. Yes, it is one of the type of properties that, uh, of course, machine learning must have, though it's very hard to define. I mean, nobody agrees on what that means. Uh, there are several uh, alternative interpretations. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, yes. So, uh, yes, so it's not just fairness, it's not just about testing. First, we have, would have to understand what fairness really means, what we are testing. And again, if you look at the literature, there isn't a clear agreement on that. And usually that lack of clear agreement is obfuscated by complicated mathematics and, you know, things that academics are very good at. But the first basic question is what is fairness? Not obvious at all. <laughs> okay, we, okay. Um, we'll discuss some more. <laughs> sure. Simos uh, is the next person who uh, raised his hand. Simos, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. So, with the same problem. Thanks for a very insightful talk, Lionel. So, quick question about the last the last uh, paper that you mentioned about HUD. You mentioned also retraining. Could you please? Very briefly, in one couple of sentences. Uh, yeah, I haven't talked about that. I haven't talked about that, but it's actually, uh, we have a paper out that you can find, and I will briefly tell you where is the retraining step in all that uh, mess. So this is the methodology, and you can see here that somehow uh, we, uh, we uh, identify uh, what we call uh, uh, clusters uh, that represent uh, 
images that have common root causes for mispredictions. And what we do is that we somehow sample from those clusters to form an augmented training set. Mm, OK. OK. Uh, you can see that here uh, in the last steps. You know. Do you, uh, do you start from scratch or from the, from the already trained network? No, 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 no. You, we, we keep already the training data we have. We just augment it. OK. Yeah. OK. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Because we don't want what worked before not to work anymore. I mean, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but is it is it the, the DNN? Is it trained from scratch or uh, from where it was and just re uh, extend the training? Ah, uh, no. Well, we well in the particular case of our case study, it depends on the case study. But the case study I've used as an example here, uh, we had a, a simulator to generate, uh, you know. The area around the eye. <laughs> OK. According to the number of parameters. For the case study I've used, which is a guess detection mm -hmm. case study. But of course, it depends on the case study. But you, you may use a, a data bank of images. You may use a, a simulator, depending on the circumstances. You know. uh, but there is always a point where you have to start training from scratch uh, at some point. Yeah. Yeah. But here we were talking about retraining using mm -hmm. the results of testing and clustering based on heat maps to support retraining. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, next question is from Kirsten. Uh, Kirsten, we can't hear you in case you're talking. I don't hear anything. No, me neither. I'm trying to unmute. Uh, oh, you unmuted yourself for a second and then muted again. Now it's unmuted again. OK, good. <laughs> it's your fingers off. Uh, yes, thanks very much for the talk. Really insightful. Um, do you see any big difference between hardware verification, you know, test based a simulation of hardware designs and where we are now uh, in terms of software? Because previously there was a, a large difference in terms of the need for hardware verification because of the incredible cost that would attract if you have to redo it. While software was easily patched, but now we're moving into an area where on the software side, we've got a lot of safety critical uh, systems. Um, and I just wondered what your views are on that. I'm not an expert in hardware verification, OK? So it's always hard to compare with something you don't know. What I know is that verification techniques like model checking have been I was told, and I've read, very successful in the realm of hardware verification. Oh, yes, they are. Yeah, they are. Okay. I was more thinking about the simulation-based and test. Yeah, but, yeah, but just just to finish my sentence, they are useful in the software context, but in very limited ways, in very in small niches. For example, there is no way you are going to apply model checking to your Simulink model. First, because you you know you you have a mix of you also have a physical dynamics in the mix, and you know. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's just, but on the other hand, uh, some of those techniques, uh, uh, you have seen, for example, I had an example where we use solvers, uh, solvers to check assumptions that we had learned, or we combine uh, solvers with search uh, to generate data from very complex constraints. Uh, they, they have a role to play, but uh, the main difference that I know is the difference of degree of success between uh, uh, formal approaches such as model checking in hardware verification and in software verification, where they only uh, have been successful in small niches. You know. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> insightful. That, that's, I would agree with that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. I think given the time we can uh, conclude the, the question and answer round here. Let's uh, thank again uh, Lionel for this uh, very insightful and interesting talk. Um, this is the last uh, talk in our talk series before the summer and after uh, summer, I think on 23rd, uh, maybe Hugo can correct me if the date is wrong, 23rd of September we will resume our verifiability talk with uh, Joel Fisher from University of Nottingham. Uh, talking about uh, their work in the TAS hub.
thanks again, Lionel, uh, for this very interesting talk. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.